dude, and even your suits in shadow, but even not in shadow, how much he stands out with the, how much the dark. You see, the other point is that it was if it had been in color, it would have been different. The mm. light suit in color is fine. Yeah. It's you know, not black and it white. It just fades into the and black the, and white. Gray, always yeah. wear a dark suit. That's yeah. something we should have. My <laughs> oh well, hell. <laughs> Why did you lose in 1960? Was it, uh, was it the debates? Well, when you lose an election by the closest margin in history, where a difference of just uh, 12, uh, no, let's start again. Uh, uh, can we, yeah, when I... Why did you lose the presidency in 1960? Was it, uh, was it the influence of the uh, Nixon-Kennedy debates? Well, the debate certainly had some effect, as all observers have pointed out. But when you lose an election by a margin of only 12,000 votes scattered in three critical states, uh, where that many would have made the difference, then any number of factors could have done it. Uh, with regard to the effect of the debates, it's interesting to note that the polls uh, between the time before the first debate and between and then an election day uh, remain relatively the same. Uh, Kennedy was ahead, actually, 51-49, according to Gallup, before the debates. Uh, he won by approximately 50 and a half to 49 and a half. So when you put all the debates together, assuming that the debates only were affecting the result, uh, you can't say that they were critical. Uh, it's a myth to suggest that I was way ahead before the debates and that the debate turned it around. That just didn't happen. I think of the factors that might have made a difference, and any one could have made a difference. Uh, these were the ones that come to mind. One, uh, we were outspent. Uh, Kennedy had a lot more money than we did. We were well financed, but we didn't dream that he would be able to do as well as he could. Uh, second, uh, the media was very, very strongly against us by a margin of five to six to one. Uh, that has been since pretty well documented. Uh, third, there was the economy. Unfortunately, a recession occurred, a very small one, it was true, uh, in that year, 1960. And it reached its depth in October, the mo worst possible time, when 400,000 more people became unemployed. And fifth, uh, in the big states, it was the fact that the Catholic vote was so overwhelmingly for Kennedy. I got the lowest percentage of Catholic votes of any candidate in history, lower even than Herbert Hoover did against Al Smith in 1928. Uh, and that made an enormous difference in the big states like New York, uh, Illinois, Pennsylvania. Uh, so under all these circumstances then, you would have to say that any one of those factors might have made the difference. Uh, but I would also say in fairness that uh, uh, John Kennedy was a very good candidate uh, it was a good contest. It was tough right down to the end. Uh, who knows? Do you think it would have been different if you had had a different running mate, if you hadn't chosen Henry Cabot Lodge and or if Eisenhower had uh, uh, campaigned more for you? Well, I wouldn't knock Lodge in the sense that I think Lodge did the best that he could uh, in the area that we had chosen him for. His expertise was in foreign policy and uh, he was extremely effective in that respect. I do think in retrospect that a better running mate would have probably been Thurston Morton uh, because a the number, some senator of those, from Kentucky? Senator from Kentucky who incidentally became national chairman for that very campaign. Uh, Morton would have helped in the states that could have made the difference. He would have helped in downstate Illinois where Lodge could not help. Uh, he would have helped in Missouri that we lost by only 12,000 votes. He would have helped in South Carolina that we lost by only 12,000 votes. Uh, when you add up those votes, you have a net a change of 12,000 over, overall that would have made a difference. How about the uh, Eisenhower involvement where not only didn't he campaign for you much, but uh, there was the, the gaffe uh, at the end or the statement uh, at a press conference that if they gave him a week, he could think no. of something you've done in the administration. I don't think there's anything that has ever embarrassed Eisenhower more than the way that so-called gaffe was played. Uh, he pointed out to me afterwards that he was just leaving the press conference. He had one every week. And uh, 
uh, somebody uh, asked a question, as they often do Ronald Reagan, and, uh, as he's walking out of a press conference. You know, he puts his hand to his ear. I hope with a hearing aid he won't have to do that again and tries to answer them. Well, Eisenhower, in this instance, uh, usually didn't try to answer them, but one of them shot at him, uh, can you name any wonder, uh, one any single thing that uh, Vice President Nixon has contributed to? And he said, well, give me a week and I'll give you an answer. He said what he meant was that next week ask me the question. He just didn't want to answer it then. Well, be that as it may, it had uh, it did have a detrimental effect because it was a highlight, one of the highlights of the first debate when Sander Van Oker, who was working very closely with the Kennedy group, he found later, uh, asked me that question. Uh, Kennedy was prepared to answer it and I was not. The second point is that I suppose that many people have the impression that Eisenhower was reluctant in supporting me. That was not true. Exactly the opposite was the case. He wanted desperately to get in that campaign. Uh, he was insisting, for example, in the last three weeks, particularly because he didn't like what Kennedy was saying about the missile gap. Eisenhower was a military man. He was very proud that the country was strong, and he didn't like this upstart, as he often called him, who knew nothing about military activities, or at least in the sense that Eisenhower knew about them, to criticize what he had done militarily. He knew that instead of having a missile gap, uh, that it was a missile gap for the Russians. We had about a 15 to 1 advantage, which of course Kennedy had to admit at the time we had the Cuban confrontation uh, after he became president. Uh, but in any event, why then didn't Eisenhower campaign? And the reason uh, was that uh, none of us could really talk about it. Uh, it hasn't come out. It's come out only lately in books. The problem was that he had had, of course, a heart attack. He had also had a stroke. He had high blood pressure. And Mrs. Eisenhower, after talking to his doctors, called Mrs. Nixon on the phone, had her on the phone for a half hour before the decision was made as to whether Eisenhower would campaign in those last two weeks and how much, and begged him with, she said her, Mrs. Eisenhower, uh, Mrs. Eisen, Mrs. Nixon told me that Mrs. Eisenhower's voice was choked. She says, it's going to kill Ike. He just mustn't do it, Pat. He just mustn't do it. And she, of course, told me that. That it was not all. Uh, Eisenhower's doctor uh, talked to me uh, before I went in to see him uh, about the balance of his schedule. And uh, he said to me, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, I want you to know that I think it would be very detrimental to the general's health. It might risk his life. He wants to do it. Don't let him know that I have said this. So I had to go through and to see President Eisenhower when he said, what can I do? And he laid out the schedule, and I had to make all sorts of lame excuses about why he shouldn't do it. Uh, but actually, the reason he didn't do it, and the reason I did not agree uh, to his going forward and doing as he wanted to, was because of those personal considerations. How did it feel on election night to, uh, as the results began to come in, or as, as trends began to emerge, to realize that at best you were losing, and at worst, because of the substantial vote fraud, that you were possibly, literally, having the election stolen away from you. How did, what was that night like? Well, election nights, uh, after all of the rigors of a campaign, and I hadn't slept for about 48 hours before that election night, because we'd had telethons, we'd flown in through Alaska and Detroit and Chicago and so forth. As a result, you're physically drained, emotionally drained, mentally drained. And so you're just numb. Uh, the only thing that will pick you up if you win. And when you lose, you become more and more numb. Uh, and as a matter of fact, insofar as the election fraud was concerned, it didn't really come home to me that night, except from one call I got from uh, Everett Dirksen's uh, administrative assistant. He called and got me on the phone. It was the only call I think I took that night. He begged me. He said, don't concede. Don't concede in Illinois. Downstate, we're coming in right on schedule, uh, and they're not going to be able to override it in C Cook County. Well, by that time uh, that uh, I decided to go down and make what was interpreted as a concession statement, uh, then that apparently did have a detrimental effect, uh, because I understand that at that time, the people downstate uh, quit counting, uh, quit watching the polls, and the people upstate of course, we're under the control of Mayor, Mayor Daley, so we lost it by 8,000 votes. Uh, so under the circumstances, I was not aware that night of the immense fraud. I had ideas about it, 
Uh, that came later. The second point, however, I should make is that what goes through the mind of a losing candidate, and I'm an expert on this, having lost a couple of them, is primarily thoughts not about himself but about his family, the impact on them, uh, his workers, his supporters, uh, everything that he has done. Uh, you just really have a feeling, what can I do to uh, justify what we've been through? It's almost painful looking at the film of that statement when you went down uh, early in the evening, uh, Mrs. Nixon trying to control her emotions. Yes. How, did, how did she and Tricia and Julie take the, the impact of that loss? Well, for her, uh, because she had campaigned so hard herself, uh, she's one of the great troopers. She's the better campaigner of the two, all of my even most passionate admirers will admit. Uh, and so it was a terrible disappointment for her. Uh, she didn't want to go down to concede. She says, I don't. And, and one of the reasons she didn't uh, was that the, uh, the media uh, had been very much against us, she thought. She says, I'm not going to go down there in front of those people after what they have done and said. And of course, they were against us by a margin of at least five or six to one. Uh, but I said, we've got to do it for our supporters. They're out there, too. And so being the good trooper that she is, she agreed to go down. And uh, it was a brave thing for her to do. Uh, Tricia came into the room uh, uh, at a time that we had decided that we'd have to make the concession statements. And, and she burst into tears, and she said, oh, Daddy, she said, uh, I'm not crying for myself. I'm crying because you and Mommy have worked so hard. And I thought that was a very touching thing to say. Uh, Julie was not up at that time. She was only 12 years old. And it was the next morning. Uh, I'd gone to bed and uh, hoping perhaps that uh, the same thing would happen to me as uh, uh, happened uh, so many years ago when uh, Charles Evans Hughes went to bed and woke up in the morning and found that he had not been elected president. I felt hoped that it would be the other way around, although I didn't expect it. In any event, uh, somebody I was in a dead sleep. I'd only slept about four hours, was shaking the bed, and it was Julie. And uh, she said, Daddy, how did the election come out? Well, that was about as uh, tough a little speech as I ever made. I said, well, this is the way that it happened. Uh, it was very, very close. Uh, we, uh, we think we may have even won it, uh, but under the circumstances, I'm afraid we, got to lose. we have lost. And she try started to cry, and then she said something which I thought was uh, quite profound. She said, well, we may have lost the election, but we won in the hearts of the people. And that, of course, was Julie. From then on, she never gave up. Uh, Julie, like her mother, like Tricia too, but even more so as a fighter. Uh, after that, I recall often talking to her. I'd go in to kiss her goodnight, and, and she would say, Daddy, can't we still win? And this was months later. Even a year later, she said, I still think we've got to have a recount in Cook County. Uh, that's Julie. How did it uh, feel in January of 1961 to stand on the platform and watch John Kennedy take the oath of office as the 35th President of the United States? Well, I suppose one who had lost a very close election and particularly under the circumstances where there was strong evidence that he might not have lost it, but that it had been stolen, that you're supposed to feel rather bitter and all that. I didn't really feel that way. Inaugurations are, for me, and I think for most Americans, almost a, a religious experience. Uh, here, the change is occurring. It's a, changing, a change occurring peacefully in a great democracy, the greatest in the world. Uh, and uh, so one feels, as I did, that you're just fortunate to be but there, to see and to participate in a moment of history. Uh, I must say that as I heard uh, uh, John Kennedy's speech, I thought it was very effective, and he delivered it as he, I would have expected very, very well and had a great impact. Uh, but as far as the content was concerned, may I say, uh, I could just hear Eisenhower's teeth gra uh, grating, uh, grating because uh, President Kennedy, President-elect Kennedy, was saying uh, the torch of leadership has passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, uh, tempered by war and with the promise of peace, etc., etc., etc. And uh, when he went on to say that uh, 
let the world know that we will fight any place, uh, any time in defense of freedom. Uh, I thought back, as I'm sure Eisenhower did, to the fact that during the campaign he had urged that Eisenhower apologize to Khrushchev uh, for the U-2 incident. He had uh, urged uh, Eisenhower not to defend Kimoy and Matsu uh, against the attacks of the Chinese Communists. So under the circumstances, those thoughts did go through my head, uh, but on the other hand, they were overridden uh, by simply the feeling almost of awe of being in the presence of such a great moment. How did you, do you remember how you spent your last night as, uh, in Washington as vice president? Well, I remember the day and the night as well. Right after the inauguration, there was a delightful luncheon. Uh, at the F Street Club given by Admiral Strauss, uh, Eisenhower's uh, close friend and his nominee for Secretary of Commerce who had been rejected, much to Eisenhower's displeasure by the United States Senate. Uh, after that luncheon, we went home. Uh, I don't remember too much what happened then, had a very light snack at, at night. And then I decided to take a, a last ride around the Capitol because I knew the next day I wasn't going to have the car. Uh, you see, a uh, vice, former vice president at that point, uh, when he leaves office, uh, he doesn't have a car, he doesn't have a secret service, et cetera, from that moment. But they did allow it for the, f the balance of the day. So uh, John Wardlaw, our driver, uh, drove me uh, through the streets of the city. Uh, I said, take us up to the Capitol. And as we drove through the streets of the city, it was really an eerie sight, almost like uh, New Year's in a way, uh, because uh, it was snowing. Uh, and as the flakes of snow began to come down, I saw the ladies with their marvelous ball gowns trying to get through uh, the snow, uh, uh, stepping over the gutters with the help of their escorts, all in white tie and tails and so forth. Uh, you could hear the singing. Uh, the noise. Uh, it was a great celebration, after all, and I understood that. I would have celebrated, too, uh, if they had been part of that campaign and had won. And finally, we got up to the Capitol, and I got out of the car, and I walked into the Capitol building, which was totally deserted at the time. Uh, the guard was very surprised to see me, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I uh, went on. Uh, I went up to my favorite place in the Capitol for what is my favorite view in the world. Uh, it's on the balcony looking down from the Capitol uh, to the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial, down through the Mall. And uh, this was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. It's always beautiful. We used to put it on our Christmas cards that we sent out as Vice President. Uh, the snow on the mall, mall, the snow was still falling and hanging on the leaves at this time. I looked all out across there. You could just see the Lincoln Memorial far off of course, the Washington Memorial you could see quite clearly because it was closer and, of course, taller. I stood there for about five minutes. And then what some you, way... What were you thinking? Uh, I, I, stu I stood there for about five minutes. And then suddenly uh, uh, a thought just rushed into my mind. Uh, not consciously, but then it seemed almost to overwhelm me. And it was, I'll be back. And as that thought came into my mind, I just turned on my heels and walked very quickly away, back to the car. What were the, what were the, uh, the options that you saw for yourself as you prepared to leave Washington after so many years and become a private citizen again? Well, the options were, frankly, very enticing, uh, particularly from a financial standpoint. As I was leaving Washington, uh, despite the fact that I had been in the House for two years, for four years, no, as I was leaving Washington, despite the fact that I had been in the House for four years and the Senate for two years and served as eight years for vice president at a very handsome salary, which was handsome then, of $35,000 a year, uh, my net worth at the end of all that service was only $47,000 and a, a battered old uh, Oldsmobile, uh, which needed some repairs. Uh, so consequently, uh, the financial rewards that might be available for our family, the girls were going to be ready for school very soon, uh, was, I must say, somewhat uh, 
uh, enticing. And uh, they were several. Jack Dreyfus, uh, who had been one of our strong supporters during the campaign financially. Uh, I didn't know him well. I only met him very briefly after he had made a very big contribution. Just rode downtown with him once uh, in New York when I was there to make a speech. And he told me that he was particularly supportive of my foreign policy. Uh, and he came to see me in Florida. I can remember him to this day. He had an open shirt on, very informal, this very, very wealthy, brilliant man. And he said he thought I should come to New York. Uh, he offered me the position of chairman and chief executive officer of the Dreyfus Corporation. Salary seemed very handsome then, <laughs> tremendously handsome. Even now it sounds pretty big. $250,000 a year, stock options, etc. If I had taken it, I'd been a very, very wealthy man at the present time. Uh, but I knew that if I did that, uh, that I, in effect, would not be able to continue to, in justice to do justice to him and to do anything in the political arena, although he had assured me that he wouldn't object to that, particularly if it were in the area of foreign policy. Then there was another offer that appealed to me. I must say a little bit more. I'm somewhat of a baseball fan, as most people are aware. And Del Webb, who was the owner of the New York Yankees, uh, was uh, a little dissatisfied with the leadership in the commissioner's office. And he came to see me in California uh, when I was out there on a trip determining what I was going to do. And he asked if I would mind if he submitted my name as a candidate for commissioner of baseball. I'm sure if I'd said yes, I would have gotten it because he was a very powerful man. Well, I must say uh, that meant a lot to me first to be offered it, and second, just the idea of being able to spend time going to the baseball games, even traveling with the teams and so forth. Uh, but I knew that that wasn't for me, and so I said no to that. Uh, and then uh, there are, of course, the offers from law firms and so forth and so on, and I finally decided that I would take an offer not from the biggest law firm in Los Angeles. The biggest one did make me an offer, a very handsome one, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher but it would have required full time uh, with no time off for any political activities. So I went with a smaller firm, uh, the uh, firm which uh, ha I felt was uh, better suited uh, for what I was going to do. We read that because of time constraints there would be no digressions today, but I can't resist a quick one uh, just to get you on the record. Mm -hmm. Who uh, is going to play in and who's going to win the World Series? Well, this year, of course, as far as the American League is concerned, uh, Chicago will win the West. Uh, and I have a feeling that uh, Chicago uh, might beat Baltimore. Baltimore will probably win the East, although you never discount Baltimore. It's going to be Chicago or Baltimore. A slight edge to Chicago because they're the new boys in town. In the World Series, uh, it'll be probably the Dodgers in the West. Uh, I can't even guess this least. I hope it's Montreal. I'd like to see the Canadians have the World Series. Uh, but in any event, I will predict that the National League, if Chicago wins the American League, will win the World Series because uh, it, this year the National League rules, which do not allow for a designated hitter, apply. Chicago's one of its major threats is Luzinski, who can only hit as a designated hitter. He can no longer field. His legs have gone, but he can sure hit the ball. So he'd be sitting out except as a pinch hitter. Without Luzinski, the Chicago White Sox would not be able to beat the Montreal Expos, Expos or the Los Angeles Dodgers if they should win it. Do you, uh, do you ever regret not taking the baseball commissionership if you had developed that and it had been offered? <clears throat> oh, yes. Uh, I regret that. You, I, I regret, for example, uh, maybe not be not having become a baseball writer or football writer or commentator and so forth. It, it's an interesting life, a fascinating life. It's never uh, too late. Well, it's a little late now. Never too late, That's though. Right. Yeah. No, they should have a younger, non-controversial person in that job. Someone <coughs> like Howard Cassell. Yes, he would. Uh, Phil Bokes. I'd, well, I'd like to get him off the air, but that'd be something else again. <laughs> No, I don't mind him for boxing, but my God, when he gives his opinions on baseball. Huh. Do, um, when you moved out to California then, did you have, uh, you still had political <clears throat> ambitions? No, not, a th uh, not really political ambitions. 
uh, as a matter of fact, I moved to California uh, not for the purpose of staying in politics or engaging in politics, but perhaps to keep my options open. I would put it that way. I knew that going to New York uh, that I would be foreclosing political participation. I felt that as the titular head of the party uh, that I should continue to speak out on issues. I would continue to make speeches around the country and so forth. And I felt, because I had a huge number of invitations uh, to go around and do that sort of thing, I felt I owed it to the party. Uh, and consequently, I felt I should take a position uh, which was afforded to me uh, in the Earl Adams firm, uh, in the Earl Adams firm, Adams, Dukey, and Hazeltine, a position uh, that would provide adequate income for me, but which would allow me the freedom which they gave me to participate in political activities. That's why I went to California. Did you see it as a viable option then that you might run or, or would run against uh, Kennedy again in 64? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. After that, uh, after the closest election in history, there was no doubt that I saw it as a viable option, and, and there's no doubt, too, that the Kennedys saw it as a viable a option because uh, they continued to harass me <laughs> once they got into power. Uh, most things you forgive in politics. You do if it's aimed at you personally. Uh, but on the other hand, when it's aimed at your family, it's very hard to forget or forgive. And Bobby Kennedy, for example, uh, initiated uh, an investigation of my mother uh, and my brother with regard to the Hughes loan, which she had satisfied, of course, with property that was worth many times and that is worth today many times more than the loan. Uh, and they were going to have a criminal investigation. That was revealed in 1972 uh, when some of the Kennedy papers began to come out. Did you know it at the time? Oh, of course not. I didn't know nothing about it. I did know something else, though. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, three times uh, audited my income tax returns. And I wonder, what in the world is this all about? Uh, this is in 1961 and 1962, as I was preparing then to run for governor. And we learn later uh, from a letter that was written by the one in charge of the audit in Los Angeles who wrote to Rosemary Woods, said that he was the one who three times messaged Washington, I have examined this, I have conducted a full field audit. There's no change because there was no, no money owed. And he said three times I got orders from the very top to continue uh, the audit and try to find something uh, that uh, they could ask for more money. Uh, that kind of harassment, I thought, was a bit beyond the pale, particularly since the election was close, particularly because I did not contest it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they play hardball. Uh, they had me down. They knew I wasn't out, and they wanted to put a couple of nails in the coffin. They almost succeeded. Could it be argued that your uh, that the investigations of Ted Kennedy in, uh, during the first uh, several months of your administration were really an equivalent of that? Well, I would say that they having done what they had done, uh, we certainly were motivated, I would say, to a certain extent uh, to investigate what we thought uh, were activities which were politically uh, detrimental as far as they were concerned and not let it be covered up. Uh, and certainly that is one of the reasons that when we talk about the investigations of Ted Kennedy, what we're talking about here, I assume, is uh, the Chappaquiddick. Chappaquiddick, yes. That's right. Do you consider uh, running for governor of California to be your greatest, looking back now, and, and given that you were looking back now, and uh, as you say, you were considering running against uh, Kennedy again in 64, do you consider running for governor of California in 1962 your greatest political mistake? Yes and no. And I, <coughs> this is not an equivocal answer because it is a yes and no proposition. From a personal standpoint, yes, because we lost the election. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at it historically, if I had not run for governor, I then would certainly have probably been drafted to, even though I had not wished to, to run for president in 1964. And I would have lost. I would have run better against Johnson than Goldwater did. But nobody was going to beat Johnson in 1964. Having run for governor and lost, I was dead as far as 1964 was concerned. 
Now let me say, I didn't plan it that way, because I didn't plan to go in and lose so I wouldn't have to run for governor. I didn't plan to go in and be governor uh, uh, so that uh, I, I didn't, I just lost my train of thought there. Uh, I didn't run and lose because uh, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't run for governor and, and uh, Let's, let's uh, start again. Let's start again. I didn't run for governor uh, and then lose uh, because of my concern that if I didn't lose, I'd have to run for president in 64 because I had every, uh, every view that perhaps I would be the strongest candidate in 64. Uh, but that's the way the thing happened. So while I don't go along with the Pollyannish idea, everything happens for the best, in this case, it did happen for the best for me politically. I would have been, because if I had run again in 64, and become a two-time loser for president, as Dewey had been after losing in 44 and 48, I would have been kaput as far as 68 was concerned. Now, on the other hand, running for governor was not something I wanted to do under any circumstances. I didn't want to be governor. Uh, and incidentally, my best friends, not all of them, but some of my best friends felt it would be a great mistake. I remember Herbert Hoover and General MacArthur, who lived about five floors apart, in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Uh, when I went to see them prior to making this decision on a visit to New York, I asked for their advice. Each of them independently, without having talked to the other, said, don't go to California. They urged me to run for Congress, as John Quincy Adams had, uh, over a hundred years before. He said, and both of them said this, MacArthur first and then Hoover, whom I saw later in that same day, they said, you should be in Washington, not in California. California basically is a great state, but it's quite parochial. You belong on the national and international scene. You can't do that in California. Uh, on the other hand, my political friends like Len Hall, Cliff Folger said, you've got to go back. You've got to run. Len Hall's argument, he said, if you don't run uh, and somebody else does and somebody else wins, uh, who's Dick Nixon going to be? He's the guy that lost for president. You've got to run in order to have a new base. So uh, after all those considerations uh, and uh, the feelings also expressed by some of my California supporters, I finally decided to run. Uh, Cap Weinberger, incidentally, the now the Secretary of Defense, was then the young chairman of the Republican Party, a moderate Republican in a relatively conservative state at that point. And he was the one that told me I was the only one that had a chance uh, to beat Pat Brown. And Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, after talking to his friends, wrote me a long letter saying that he had finally determined uh, that I should run. Incidentally, in that respect, uh, one other intriguing possibility that was raised for me before I came to California was raised by Raymond Moley, uh, the columnist. Raymond, Noley, uh, Raymond Moley had followed politics for years in Britain and the United States. And he urged me to become chairman of the Republican National Committee. He said, there you have a forum. Uh, you can be the head of the loyal opposition. You're a great organizer. You can organize the party uh, and strengthen it. Uh, that also was a proposition that I considered uh, but did not follow through on. Uh, coming just two years after this uh, searing defeat for uh, president, how did, uh, and, and presumably enjoying the life uh, back in California, how did uh, Mrs. Nixon and uh, Tricia and Julie feel about your re-entry into the political arena? Uh, not enthusiastic, if I can, may use British understatement. Uh, Tricia and Julie, uh, to an extent, were more resigned to it because they were, they were still quite young. Uh, but as far as Mrs. Nixon was concerned, she was adamantly against it. Uh, she said, we've just been through a campaign. Uh, we're just getting back on our feet. Uh, we owe time to the girls, which we did. Uh, uh, we owe time to ourselves. We just can't go through this again so soon. Uh, she knew very well she, what she was talking about. How did you break the news? Well, I uh, had the, we had a family conference. I mean, you have that at when you're a candidate for president or governor or vice president, uh, whatever the case might be. And in this instance, uh, I went over the pros and cons, and uh, she said, well, let me just make one thing clear. If you decide to run, you're going to run on your own. 
He says, I'm not going to be there campaigning with you as I did when you ran for the House and the Senate and Vice President and President. And so she left the room. And uh, the girls were in tears. So I went up to my study and our place and sat down in the easy chairs I usually did with a yellow pad and because I had to have a press conference the next day to announce what I was going to do. I had already indicated that I would. And I was making notes as to why I would not run for governor of California. Uh, the light was rather dim and she came into the room. She came over and she said, you know, Dick, he said, I've been thinking about this thing. I think it's a terrible mistake for you to run. But if you decide to do it, she said, I'll be there with you. And she leaned down, kissed me in the forehead, and left the room. Well, since she had agreed, I went ahead and did it. But she was right, uh, because we, of course, did lose. We have uh, some film of a famous event in Richard Nixon's political career. to kick around anymore because gentlemen this is my last press conference why did you hold your last press conference you know my main regret and frankly only regret about that conference curiously enough that I didn't do it sooner uh, those of us particularly on the conservative side in politics we take so much crap from the media uh, and uh, we hip hypocritically go through this charade that we think the press is fair, uh, that they're just doing their job, and so forth. They're not fair. They're deliberately unfair. Uh, when, you, when you look, for example, at the polls taken of Washington correspondents uh, in terms of 1960, uh, they were in the neighborhood of four to five to one for Kennedy. Uh, in the case, for example, in 1968, when I was running against Humphrey, uh, the top Washington correspondents, the 200, this is in television uh, and also uh, among newspapers as well, the top Washington correspondents uh, were for Hubert Humphrey by 80% to 20%. Uh, in 1972, when 61% of the people voted for Nixon, uh, the Washington uh, and national correspondents in television and the media uh, were 82% for McGovern. Well, that's got to tell you something. And so I had been going through this through all these years. Oh, I don't mean that I didn't have good friends in the press. I did have some. Uh, I don't mean, that s too, that uh, all of them were against me all the time. Uh, I think particularly when I went to Moscow in 1959 uh, that I got a relatively good press. But on the other hand, generally speaking, they're just against me, against me because they didn't agree with me. Uh, and so I understood that. But on the other hand, I was not going to continue to go through the charade uh, that I felt they were fair. And so now, uh, in the California campaign, it was worse than ever. Uh, I made a number of what, of, of what I thought very constructive speeches and proposals about government in California, what we would do about crime, what we would do about jobs, getting more jobs into the state, a better industrial climate, and so forth and so on. Didn't make a blip. Just couldn't get it covered. All they wanted to go into was to whether or not I was running for president again, and particularly badgering me about the Hughes loan, other things, which they knew were phony issues, uh, political issues raised by the opposition. Well, in any event, that morning, uh, it was all over. I had made a concession statement. In other words, sent out a written statement, congratulated Brown, and so forth and so on, by wire. And I happened to tune in the television, and here was Herb Klein, one of the kindest, most gentle men who's ever been a press secretary. He's really too good for him. <laughs> he never criticizes them. He never talks to their publishers or their editors or bitches about them in any way. He's always trying to be nice to them thinking that if he's nice to them, they'll be nice to us. Uh, I don't mean he's a soft man, uh, but I mean that's just his way. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman in a business where there are damn few gentlemen. And so in any event, 
Here they were badgering per, poor Herb Klein, saying, why doesn't Nixon come down and concede? I said, fine, I'll go down and concede. But when I conceded, I was going finally to tell them exactly what they'd been up to. Uh, I have no regrets about saying it. Incidentally, one of the best things I ever did politically. Because from that time on, and I think perhaps for the first time, uh, the press began to respect me a little more. They were afraid that maybe I'd crack them again. And believe me, I would have if they'd come at me. There, there are some, uh, perhaps many, who will watch and hear you say what you've just said and say that this is a classic expression, case book quality, of Nixon media paranoia. How do you, are you aware of that? And how do you respond to this, this continuing response to your claims or to your objections that you are unfairly treated by the media, that this is, uh, that you just have a paranoid blank on this subject? No, I'm not paranoid about it all. I just say, let's look at the record. Uh, and uh, all the media has to do is to look at its record in 1960, uh, look at its record in 1962, 1968, 1972, uh, and they will find uh, that they have been very heavily prejudiced. Uh, I'm speaking of they in the broadest sense, a majority, uh, that they haven't given me the same fair treatment that they have given to some of the candidates on the other side who support their political views. It's only an honest statement. And anybody who sits there and says, uh, well, really, they're all very fair, they're treating us subjectively, uh, is just wrong. I think the problem is this. Uh, the media constantly harps on credibility. Uh, are political figures credible? Well, I think the media's got to look at their credibility. Uh, and as I say, when you look in 1972 and find 82 percent of the media, the top honchos, uh, going for McGovern, uh, and only 38 percent of the people going for him, I don't know who's out of sync here. But for me to sit here and say, oh, in spite of that, the media were very fair to me, that's just not true. They aren't and weren't. Why do people uh, put up with this? Because if, if reporters are as liberal as you say they are, that certainly doesn't represent the mass of public opinion. Why does the average person sitting at home who is not that kind of liberal uh, accept this kind of liberal <coughs> treatment of people like yourself or of news in general? Well, Why doesn't the market establish itself and demand more neutral or indeed uh, right of center news coverage? The market does. Uh, for example, my famous silent majority speech in 1969 proved that. The media was about 90 percent to bug out of Vietnam, and yet we went up to 68 percent in the polls when I came out strongly for the silent majority to stand up uh, rather than to bug out. Uh, the people are smarter than you think in this thing. Uh, I think, too, though, let's look at politicians. Why don't politicians uh, speak up as far as the media are concerned. I mean those that think they're getting a bad rap. And the reason is the same reason that I, that motivated me up until that conference in 1962. They got the whip hand. Uh, you, you try to answer them, uh, you try to defend yourself, uh, and they'll write it or they'll go on the air and, uh, and come back at you. They have the last word. And so under the circumstances, and this is where Herb Klein professionally was probably right uh, when he advised, well, there's no use to take them on uh, because they'll be even worse. Uh, that was his view. My own view is, in retrospect, though, as far as I was concerned, uh, they couldn't have been worse, in my opinion, more unfair. Uh, at least I got some degree of respect because basically, deep down, uh, they're not the bravest people in the world uh, when they write these words. And if you take them on, uh, they then have got to show a little bit of deference Do you think views, at least. Do you think it's possible for a conservative uh, commentator or reporter or analyst to rise through the ranks of network news as it now exists, uh, which is another way of saying, I guess, do you think that there's any hope that the situation you've described as you see it will ever be changed? None at all. Uh, it's a fact of life. It's something that commentators uh, uh, 
have got to recognize as a fact of life. There is not a conservative commentator in the air today. There's nobody that I would even put in the center uh, at the present time. I don't mean by that that Howard K. Smith uh, was not a very responsible man. Uh, he's now off the air. John Chancellor at times can be very, very fair in the field of foreign policy and so forth. And I don't mean that they're all unfair all the time. I am saying that deep down, as the Rothman Lichter polls, and they basically are not conservatives, as they've all indicated, the overwhelming majority of the media feel that way. Let, let's look at the polls, for example, of the top media people in television and newspapers in the year 1980. Reagan wins by a landslide. As far as those commentators were concerned, you know how they came out? Carter had over 50 percent, about 51 percent. You know who was second? John Anderson. Reagan ran a poor third. In other words, if the media was going to determine who was president, Jimmy Carter would be president today, and the country would be in a terrible shape. Now, my point is this. It isn't going to change, but political leaders like Ronald Reagan, uh, who can fight against this thing effectively and go over the heads of the media, uh, are the only hope uh, to appeal to that silent majority that is still out there. I still insist that it's very important for anyone who is in politics uh, to recognize that if he filters all of his views through the media, assuming he's a conservative, he's dead. Therefore, he must find ways to go over them and around them. And that's what I was trying to do as president. Do you have uh, a 25 word or less assessment of Dan Rather's credibility as a reporter slash anchorman to fill Walter Cronkite's shoes? Well, I think Dan Rather is perhaps the most effective anchorman of all at the present time. He's intelligent, he's tough, uh, he's considered pretty credible. After the rough edges that he had at the beginning, he has gotten a little bit more of the soft shoe manner that Walter Cronkite, Cronkite used so effectively over the years. Uh, he comes on with that good automatic smile at the end when he says, uh, when they usually put one of those soft line uh, things on at the end. And, and it's, it's rather endearing, and as I'm, I'm sure that he hopes it will be. Now, as far as his credibility is concerned, uh, it isn't as high as Cronkite's because of his background of having been more partisan. Cronkite was partisan. Uh, there isn't much question about that. I think he'd be the first to admit it because he's an honest man. Uh, but on the other hand, Cronkite was clever enough to know that he didn't want to be, appear to be that way and rather is beginning to learn that. Uh, I think that he is smart enough, and after all, when he's earning up their $2 million a year, uh, he isn't going to throw that baby out. So I think he's going to be smart enough to keep his ratings up by not going too far overboard and not providing balance. But uh, believe me, though, if Ronald Reagan's possibilities of being reelected president depended upon what kind of favorable retreatment he's going to get in CBS, he might as well go back to that ranch right tomorrow. There's no way that he'd make it. But I think he's going to override him. What kind of <clears throat> person do you think becomes a reporter? Very intelligent people, uh, people that are publicly oriented, people that want to be in public life, uh, and uh, people that are willing to uh, make great sacrifices in order to succeed. On uh, right after your uh, 1962 election, ABC ran a network show called the uh, Politi Political Obituary of Richard Nixon. How did it feel to sit in front of the tube and watch your own obituary? Well, <clears throat> neither you or our listeners will believe this. I didn't see the program. I don't look at programs of that sort. Uh, I got reports, of course, from the family who did watch it uh, because it had been well publicized. Uh, incidentally, Howard K. Smith had been uh, the man who presided over that first debate uh, with Kennedy. He did it very fairly. and. During my presidential years, I found him to be one of the most responsible reporters, particularly on Vietnam, that we could possibly find. I consider him objective, 
a good friend at this point. At that time, I think he thought it was news to put Alger Hiss on uh, a program which was entitled The Political Obituary of Richard Nixon. Uh, I learned later, too, however, that he had put Jerry Ford on to defend me. And I understand Jerry Ford did a very good idea, so I was pleased to hear that. Uh, so my reaction was, well, what's new? So now they've trotted Hiss out. And I thought that's just an indication of how low my fortunes were. But all hell broke loose as far as the networks are concerned. I guess ABC got more wires on that than they've ever gotten before that time objecting. Uh, Eisenhower was furious. He got some of his friends to uh, become motivated on it. Uh, and uh, Howard Smith wrote me a letter years afterwards and tried to make it clear that he hadn't done the program simply as a hatchet job. And I don't think he had intended it. He had done it because he thought it was newsworthy. Why did you uh, move to New York after your defeat uh, in the California gubernatorial race? Wasn't that uh, burning your, not only burning, but sort of mining your bridges and blowing them up uh, in terms of a political future? It was time to move. Uh, time to move because had I stayed in California, I would still be the titular head of the Republican Party. Uh, now, being titular head is about as useful as being the fifth tit on a uh, cow. But on the other hand, it is a responsibility that you have. Uh, and I didn't feel that I could do a very good job in that. The second thing, I think, was that I, I was tired of campaigning, I really worn out from it. I'd been through it in 60, I'd been through it in 62. Uh, that year, for example, 62 that I ran, 61 and 62, one of the hardest of all my life because I wrote a book, Six Crises. Uh, I worked in my legal activities. I made speeches around the country uh, and, of course, did the campaign. So you just get bushed. And at that point, I decided that it was time to leave California, get out of the political arena. I know that I, I felt that coming to New York, there'd be no problem of being involved in the political arena because that was Nelson Rockefeller's turf. And I know that knew that he didn't play uh, softball either. Uh, so uh, that motivated me. I think another motivation was the family. Uh, it was very hard for our uh, two girls out there. You see, in that primary campaign in California in 1962, the, uh, the right wing was out after me, the John Birch Society, for example. Uh, I was heckled at stop after stop. I mean, heckling me as being soft on communism. Why were they after? Why were you considered, of all people, considered to be soft on communism? Even, by the even after Society? Caracas, after uh, Khrushchev in the kitchen, and so forth, because I had been part of the Eisenhower administration, and the John Birch Society uh, had criticized Eisenhower as being soft on communism, and Foster Dulles was a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy, and I defended both, uh, and so they raised the devil about that. Uh, so under the circumstances, I remember uh, that uh, uh, it was pretty tough uh, in that campaign because uh, when, when, you, when you look at how it happened, uh, I started out with a lead of about 10 points over Pat Brown. Uh, and uh, Pat Brown was a, was a genial, I, I thought rather ineffective, but uh, not too controversial governor. So that helped him on that side because there are more Democrats in California. He was not considered to be on the left. If he'd been on the left, he would have lost for sure. Uh, but in addition to that, in this primary, we had the problem uh, that we were split. And Shell, from the right, got a third of the vote in a primary. And in this case, many of them did not come back. They thought I was too left wing, which I think is uh, perhaps a pretty good indication of where I stood as well. Did you ever support? And let me say that as far as the Birchers were concerned, uh, many of them and their children, children can be very cruel, had been, made it pretty rough on Trisha and Julie at the private school they were attending. And so uh, when I announced that I felt, after talking to Pat, that I thought uh, we should move, they jumped up and down. Trisha went in, I remember, and uh, got all of her uh, homework out of the drawers and threw it away in the wastebasket. She thought we were going that very day. Of course, we didn't. We went toward the end of the year. Did you ever support the John Birch Society uh, and or do you, do you feel that it did any good or does any good today? Well, far from supporting it, uh, 
I would say that I was perhaps its most effective opponent. Uh, I did so certainly with a great deal of concern because some of my friends were in it. Ek Heastan, the former congressman from California, Johnny Russolo, two of my strongest supporters. They joined the John Birch Society. But I could not uh, do anything but take on a society uh, that had called Eisenhower uh, a soft on communism, John Foster Dulles a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. That, that was the nuts. I mean, you could just hear them crackling there in the head. They were scary. Matter of fact, I remember one time that uh, a lot of the far right had infiltrated the young Republicans. The young Republicans were supposed to, young were supposed to be liberal, but not in the Republican Party. They're very, very conservative. And I was speaking to them in, San, in Sacramento at their convention, and they began to heckle me about something I was saying on foreign policy and so forth. I brought them up a little short, though. I said, just remember, I've been heckled by experts. That quieted them down fast. It reminded them of the fact that at one time they had supported me in the kitchen, in Caracas and so forth. But be that as it may, as far as the John Birch Society is concerned, I would have to say that in their hearts, their motivations, nobody can quarrel with them. I mean, there is a communist conspiracy. Uh, our policies have not been effective. I think, however, they've done more harm than they've done good because they overstate it, like McCarthy, who overstated his case. He had a very good case about the State Department having people who belonged to Communist Front, but when he went so far as to say they are, there were 61 card-carrying communists, he overstated it, and as a result, uh, that cleared the rest of them as well. And so it is with the John Birch Society. Uh, they give sort of a kooky uh, feeling uh, to the responsible conservatives, the responsible hawks, uh, and that doesn't help us at all. After you, uh, after your move to New York, you began a fairly mm -hmm. extensive series of foreign trips that uh, that uh, went on from then uh, up until your campaign. Uh, you began your campaign for president. Uh, you saw, uh, as you traveled abroad, you saw business leaders, political leaders, everybody from uh, President Nasser to uh, Paul Getty. Uh, was this part of a, a conscious plan to uh, keep your political options open or indeed to build political bases? No, that foreign uh, travel was due to two things. It was due first uh, to the fact that the law firm I was with, a very fine firm, uh, had some international clients, and so it fitted in with my legal responsibilities. Uh, the second was that I was very interested in foreign policy, uh, and I welcomed the opportunity to travel abroad. Uh, and I think there was a third factor as well. I received a lot of invitations to come abroad uh, from government leaders that I had known over the years as vice president. And so I welcomed that chance. For example, I went to Europe several times uh, during that period. Uh, I was in Asia six times. There were six trips to Tokyo. There were five to Vietnam. Uh, the purpose of it was not to travel until the 1967 trip for the purpose of uh, simply becoming a candidate again. Uh, but on the other hand, all of that foreign travel, travel helped me enormously. Not so much in getting publicity, and I got some but more in terms of learning what the world was all about, how the world works, uh, so that uh, by the time I ran for president again in 1968, I was far more experienced, had a better understanding of the world, all the world, than I had in 1960. So I was better qualified in 68 to be president than I was in 1960. What did you learn about the world from J. Paul Getty? Well, J. Paul Getty, was a fascinating man. I mean, he's the richest man in the world, and so obviously I was happy to see him. He had been a contributor, not a heavy contributor, uh, to our campaign in 1960, so I wanted to express my appreciation when he invited us uh, to come to his uh, famous place in London, uh, outside in the outskirts of London, this huge mansion and so forth. Uh, Mrs. Nixon, and Tricia, and Julie, and I welcomed the opportunity. And I remember he was very gracious. Uh, he had a very, very deep voice. 
Uh, he used to sit and say very, very little. He was kind and well-mannered and the rest. But when he went into lunch, one thing impressed me enormously. It was a magnificent room. Uh, we were served on gold plates, uh, gold silverware. It wasn't, uh, wasn't just gold covered, gold, solid gold silverware and gold goblets. Uh, a gourmet French chef prepared beautiful delicacies. There were vintage wines. So I looked up at the head of the table. And here sat J. Paul Getty, the richest man in the world. You know what he had? Graham crackers and milk. And so I realized that there are other things than being rich. We were fortunate to have our health despite those defeats. I think we've come to the end of an hour. We'll take a short break. Have some graham crackers and milk. Yeah. Didn't change that anything. much, yeah. Or, but on the other hand, who is to say, for example, what could happen when you stop going to the media? You stop going to the Catholic vote? You stop going to the recession? Yeah, what you were going to do. Yeah, it was tough. And just a sick one. Well, pretty good as far as we did. Bye. Did President Kennedy's death make you reassess your own uh, political situation in terms of running in 1964? Oh, yes, it did. Uh, and in part it did because many of my friends uh, talked to me thereafter and said, well, now it's very important for you to consider running again. Uh, I considered it, but only briefly, uh, because when I analyzed the situation, I could see that Barry Goldwater was way out in front. Uh, he had done a superb job, and his supporters had done a very good job, of mobilizing the party faithful across the country. Uh, it seemed to me that it was his turn uh, and that he was going to get it. Who else was in the field then? Well, of course, uh, Governor Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, was still in the fields. Uh, and uh, the possibility, remote possibility, that George Romney might get in. Of course, Bill Scranton made it an abortive push right at the last. but. Any realist would know there was no way anybody was going to get that nomination but Barry Goldwater. Uh, I knew it. Uh, what I felt it was important, and President Eisenhower felt the same thing, uh, that uh, he not get it without having some kind of a contest. We felt they should, we should have interest in the campaign and also enough of a contest so that some of Barry's rougher edges might be tempered a bit before he got into the final campaign. Uh, we didn't do a very good job accomplishing that, however. He rolled over the opposition so easily at San Francisco that uh, he just got more the way he was. Let go water be go water. You uh, wrote in your memoirs that you were almost physically sick as you sat on the platform uh, having introduced him to the convention in San Francisco in 1964 and listened to his acceptance speech. Uh, why was that and, and why did you then campaign up and down the country <coughs> for him uh, right through November? Well, you have to know the background. Uh, I introduced him. And that was the role I had at the convention. Uh, it was only a 20-minute speech, and I would rate it probably the best political speech I ever made. Uh, every line had been written out, uh, carefully crafted. Uh, I remember the peroration very, very well. Uh, I said to the audience out there, because I knew that Goldwater had gotten a very, very bad press, I said, you've heard about this man, you've heard he's an extremist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Listen to him. Judge for yourselves. And then I said, now I present to you the man who by his work in the vineyards over the years has earned the title of Mr. Conservative, who by the action of this convention is now Mr. Republican, and who with your support will become Mr. President. Barry Goldwater. The place came apart. Goldwater came in and got a huge, huge ovation. And we sat down and waited to hear this man that I had urged the, the nation, as well as the delegates, to listen to. Uh, he started by reading out of the party those that didn't support him. After I, in my speech, had 
tried to bring Romney people and Scranton people and Rockefeller people in behind our new candidate. He said, those that were not for us, we don't want you. And then he made a very famous statement. Uh, he said, uh, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Uh, moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. Now, you take those two sentences and read them, they're okay, but not from Barry Goldwater, because they were nailing him with the idea of being an extremist, of being a little kooky on foreign policy and domestic policy as well. Uh, now, he wasn't a kook, but on the other hand, every time he opened his mouth, he proved their point. And so I sat there and listened to that, and I knew it was down the tube. I th thought there was very little chance before that, but he had split the party. He was appealing to his own constituency only, and he had given Johnson and the Democrats the opportunity to tag him with the extremist label. Didn't you know what he was going to say? Oh, my, no. I didn't see the speech. Weren't you part of the, uh, didn't they show it around to leaders of the party? And... <laughs> they didn't show it to me. If it, they had, it would never have been in that speech. In the wake of the uh, Goldwater debacle, did you, uh, how did you assess your political chances in terms of coming back uh, and running in 1968? Well, I should first point out why I campaigned for Goldwater after that. Uh, President Eisenhower, with whom I was in very close contact and I, uh, met with Goldwater and other Republicans at Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were attempting to get him to moderate some of his positions, uh, not to become a mushy moderate, which is the worst thing. Far better to be a liberal or a conservative than to be a mushy moderate, stand for nothing. We didn't want him to do that, but we wanted him at least to be responsible. And so we had a long talk with him. Eisenhower particularly really read the act and said, Barry, you've got to quit saying these cockeyed things and words to that effect and so forth. And Barry said, well, that's the way I am, but I'll try to. So we all went out and had a joint press conference, and Barry made it worse than ever. They asked some question about what he would do uh, insofar as the use of nuclear weapons was concerned in Europe. He said, well, I think we ought to give the responsibility and the power to launch those weapons to our commanders in the field. Well, Eisenhower just practically cringed because he knew that was first politically inadvisable and also militarily the wrong decision. You can't leave that decision, one that will bring nuclear war in the hands of a field commander in Europe, no matter how good he is. Afterwards, I rode from Hershey back to Gettysburg with Eisenhower in the car. Uh, he gritted his teeth. That's, that's what he usually did with me. He just gritted his teeth and his head, forehead to get all flushed up. He said, you know, before Barry met with us today, I thought he was just stubborn. Now, I think he's just plain damn dumb. And uh, which, again, was only his immediate reaction. Goldwater wasn't dumb. <laughs> it's just the way he is. He's irrepressible. He says anything that comes to the top of his head, and uh, consequently, uh, it was not uh, easy. Now, as a matter of fact, in campaigning for him, I did it for a number of reasons. One, I knew the party was in trouble. I knew we were going to lose. But defeat is not fatal unless you don't fight. It was very important to fight. Rockefeller wouldn't help. Scranton couldn't do very much. Most of the other moderates stood it out, so-called. I was the only one around that could help, and the candidates around the country, people in the Senate and the House, uh, were begging me to come in. I, I'll never forget, though, it was pretty tough to come in. I'd go into campaign in this state or the other and candidate in advance and get the word to me. They'd say, please, please, when you endorse Goldwater, could you put it at another part of the speech? Don't put him with me. So the way I did it, I worked it out that at the very beginning, I would endorse all the local candidates and the candidate for the House and the Senate. And then in the peroration, I'd go all out for Goldwater. Uh, that seemed to cut it all right. In any event, I drew huge crowds in that uh, campaign. Actually made more speeches for Goldwater than he made for himself. But I have no gr regrets about it. It was the right thing to do. The party was still alive, although weakened as a result of the campaign. And from a personal standpoint, and I didn't do it for that reason, but from a personal standpoint, it proved to be indispensable to my winning in 1968, because that hard core of Goldwater people, with Rockefeller deserting them and others not supporting them, they felt a debt to me. Uh, so when we came to 68, I had the support 
not only of Goldwater personally, but of those workers out there because they felt I had stood by them when others had not. In other words, the old saw, this is the time for good men to come to their aid of their parties. That was the time to do it. When the party is down, easy to support the party when it's on the way up or going to win. You uh, say that that 1964 uh, convention speech was, as you look back on it, your best political speech. Do you have a memory of uh, one that you consider to be your worst or least best political speech? No, I, there would be too many candidates there for me to select them out. I've never made a speech that I consider to be basically perfect. I've never felt one, uh, I've never made a speech that I felt could not have been improved upon. Uh, I felt, for example, that my 1960 acceptance speech was better than the, my 1968 or 72 acceptance speeches, although each was quite effective. Uh, but on the other hand, in 1960, if I had to do over again, I would have perhaps cut three or four minutes out of it, uh, out of the early part, so that I could have greater impact at the end. But uh, who knows? Do you have, uh, or maybe it's a busman's holiday for you to go to speeches like this, but do you remember a a speech that you heard that uh, that you considered to be the best that you found moving or inspiring or persuasive? Oh, there's no question about the first candidate there. That's MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur's famous speech, uh, No Old Soldiers Never Die, uh, when he came back from Korea, was the most moving speech I've ever heard. He was a master. In the wake of the uh, uh, debacle, uh, the Goldwater debacle in 1964, did you uh, reassess your own position in terms of uh, running in 1968 for president? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I first incidentally uh, read Nelson Rockefeller out of the party. It wasn't personal, but, but what really got me down, after Goldwater lost, uh, Rockefeller proceeded to kick him, and he tried to read Goldwater out of the party. And so, uh, how did he do that? Well, he just had a press conference and said that uh, uh, this election had been a rejection of Barry Goldwater and everything he stood for, and so forth and so on. Well, now you don't do that, particularly not then. Uh, let the election speak for itself. So I had a little press conference and I said uh, that Rockefeller had not supported the candidate. Uh, he was therefore the last one. Uh, that should speak out now, the last one the party would turn to him. I said the party was not going to turn for new leadership uh, to those that had not supported the candidate in 1964. Uh, I also used a rather colorful phrase. I said he's had his pound of flesh. Uh, let him subside. And so that handled that problem. Uh, then in 1965, I guess it was my birthday, 1965, I began to reassess my situation. Uh, I have a sort of an old Quato custom on birthdays. I used to always sit down uh, and uh, make a list of things that I might like to do in the next year. And so I listed various things I would hope to do in the year 1965. Uh, and as I did so, the thought occurred to me then that uh, everything that I should do or would do between 1965 and 1968 had to be done in the context of the possibility of running again. I didn't decide to run then, uh, but I opened my mind for the first time to the possibility thereof. Because after 1962, for example, uh, the defeat for governor of California, the idea never occurred to me to run again. I thought I was dead, and I still thought I was dead after 1964. But after the Goldwater defeat, after Rockefeller had sat it out, I realized there was the possibility that I might be the one that could bring the party together and possibly win. Uh, but I didn't cross that bridge then. I just felt, however, that everything that I would do then had to be had to fit into that particular pattern. What was uh, what was Rockefeller like? One one gets the sense that he didn't sit around. Uh, just crumbling up graham crackers into milk uh, with all his money and power and ambition. Rockefeller was a, a, a very attractive uh, uh, individual, attractive in the sense that uh, he not only was rich, uh, but he very gregarious. Uh, he usually come up, hiya fella, uh, that's the Rockefeller trademark and so forth. It turned some people off, didn't turn me off. 
Uh, but he, uh, uh, he, you could have a good talk with him. He could be very candid at times. Uh, and at other times, uh, he, he could be uh, perhaps a bit on the devious side. He was a good politician, no question about that. I remember very well how blunt he could be. He lived, of course, in the same building that we did. And uh, in uh, 1967, uh, after the 1966 elections, I remember that he talked to me about the possibility of his running in 1968. He made a very interesting point. He was very direct. He said, look, he said, uh, in 1968, it's got to be uh, certainly uh, uh, somebody other than Goldwater. She said, you know, Goldwater isn't too smart. He only went to college for two years. I was almost tempted to ask him, how many years did Lincoln go to college? It was a little bit arrogant and so forth on his part. But was he, he a snob? Uh, subconsciously, yes. He did, not consciously. Uh, but when you're that rich and have had everything on a silver platter all your life, it's very difficult not to show just a little bit of that arrogance. It's the subconscious or even, I should say, unconscious arrogance of unlimited wealth. And he said, well, Scranton is waiting for a draft, and there's no draft around with his name on it. He says, only you or I can do it. And uh, he said, you aren't going to run or shouldn't run because you're too smart to do that right at the present time. Uh, I said, I will run, uh, and then if I can't make it, I'll support you. Well, we didn't make any deal. You, uh, you say that uh, Rockefeller was uh, a good politician and therefore mm -hmm. partly devious. Uh, you are a past master politician. Uh, how devious are you? Well, uh, when necessary, uh, one has to be devious. Uh, President Eisenhower, I think, is the best example of that. He, uh, he was devious himself. He used others to do things that he did not want to do himself. And he respected that quality in others as well. What is your definition of devious? It means uh, not doing directly uh, something uh, that may lose you support when you can find some other way to do it indirectly that will accomplish the end. As you uh, looked at the uh, political landscape from 64 to 68, uh, what use did you consider making or what use did you see to be made of the 1966 congressional elections? Well, the 1966 congressional elections were vitally important to 1968 for a fundamental reason. Uh, in 1960, when I ran, I knew that one of the reasons that I lost was that the Republican Party was so weak. After the 1958 elections, uh, we only had 14 Republican governors uh, out of the 50. Uh, we only had 34 Republican senators. Uh, we had only 155 members of the House. I had to run 5% ahead of the ticket in 1960 if I were to win. I did run 5% ahead, uh, but I still lost by that minimal amount. So I realized that in 1968, we had to close that gap some, because after 1964, the party was down to the same level it was in 1958. So we had to increase the number of governors. We had to increase the number of senators, increase the number of congressmen. It wouldn't be equal to what the Democrats have, but the Republican candidate for president wouldn't have to run 5% ahead, maybe 2 to 3% ahead. And that's exactly what we accomplished in that 1966 campaign. In that campaign, uh, I was uh, pretty perceptive. Uh, I must say I didn't have any polls to base this on. I just censored as I campaigned around the country. But a month before the election, I made the flat prediction uh, that we were going to have a great victory. Somebody said, well, could you give us the numbers? I said, sure. I said, we're going to win 40 new members of the House. We're going to elect three new members of the Senate. We're going to elect six new governors and 700 state legislators. Everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, it wasn't possible. Well, as a matter of fact, after the election was held and we got the returns that night, it was even a little better than I had expected. We had actually won, we'd actually won 47 new House seats, three senators, eight governors, uh, and a great number in the state legislature. Uh, so that gave the party the new life. It created a new plateau, a higher plateau, plateau for the presidential campaign uh, candidate to pole vault from 
in order to win in 1968. Towards the end of that campaign, President Johnson in a press conference dropped what turned out to be uh, a bombshell, and it turned out that he dropped it directly on you. We have a film of that. <clears throat> yeah, I do not want to get in a debate uh, on a, a foreign policy meeting in Manila with a chronic campaigner like Mr. Nixon. He, uh, he, it's his problem to find fault with his country and with his government during a period of October every two years. If you look back over his record, you'll find that true. He never did really recognize and realize that what was going on when he had an official position of government. You remember what President Eisenhower said, that uh, he'd take, if you'd ask, give him a week or so, he'd figure out what he was doing. How did it feel like to be called a chronic campaigner? Well, first I must say that President Eisenhower called me after that, and he said, you've got to answer this. He says, every time anybody raises that goddamned give me a week thing, it just uh, raises my blood pressure. Uh, he was really pretty teed off by it. Uh, as far as being called a chronic campaigner by Johnson, he could have called me a lot worse. He knows a lot worse words than that. What did you do to uh, capitalize on the uh, positive results to, to get, a, get a, a running start on this pole vault that you describe uh, as a result of the results of the 1966 elections? Well, we should first understand why Johnson said this. Uh, he doesn't use such rhetoric unless something had been effective. Uh, and uh, what had happened there is that he came back from Manila and there was a communique about the Vietnam War, uh, which in a public statement, I just tore to shreds. Uh, Bill Sapphire was very helpful in preparing that statement, incidentally. It was reprinted in full in the New York Times uh, and across the country. And that just sent him right up the cotton picking wall. Uh, that's why he responded as he did. But after that, I got national television time and made uh, what I consider to be one of my top two or three best television addresses, again, totally without notes, uh, in which I uh, said in effect to President Johnson, I said, if you're listening, he said, I want you to know that I know how tired a man can be when he's done all this work in the office. I know uh, I, I realize that you're one of the hardest working men that has ever served as president. And uh, when that happens, that maybe you say things that uh, you might not uh, really, uh, should, you, you shouldn't say, you wouldn't have said if you weren't tired and so forth. Well, of course, I figured that'd drive him up the wall a little bit more. I understand that it did. How but the broadcast was very effective and uh, may have helped get the margin up to what we had hoped the, the great gains of the victory of 1966. How did you use the combination of the publicity from this broadcast and the results of the 66 uh, elections to, to sort of give you a, um, a, ru a running start for that pole vault uh, towards 68? Well, I, I did something very unique and very unexpected. Uh, everybody after the 66 elections assumed that now the race for the roses begins or the brass ring or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I remember that the news magazines had on their covers uh, the winners of 1966. And there, of course, were Romney and uh, Scranton, et cetera, et cetera, the others who had won, the new faces particularly. And then I remember one commentator in particular, and I think other columnists may have made the same point, said that the big loser in 1966, ironically, was Richard Nixon. He, after having labored for the candidates across the country, probably more responsible than anybody else for the great victory, has an effect, uh, weakened his own chances because there are so many new faces on the scene. So uh, I read that. I didn't, incidentally, I didn't consider that to be unfair reporting because I think it was quite accurate that that was the case because Romney, unless he'd have won as he did in 1966, uh, he would not have been a national figure. And so under the circumstances, I had to determine what was I going to do. Now, my friends all urged me uh, when we all sat down for, at El Morocco that night in 1966 after midnight celebrating the great victory. We had spaghetti, incidentally, and red wine. 
And uh, why do you remember that? Because uh, I didn't go to El Morocco very often. I think that was the only time I went there while I was living in New York. Why did you have spaghetti at El Morocco? Uh, because late at night, it didn't seem to me that anything more exotic would go down. Uh, and I like spaghetti. <laughs> Two good reasons. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> and I thought, I think it goes well with red wine. In any event, my friends then, now you've got to get in. You've got to announce for president and so forth and get the ribbon clerks out. I said, no, I'm going to think about it. And the way that I made the decision is very interesting, a decision that shocked all of my supporters and also my opponents as well. I had to go on Meet the Press or Face the Nation, one of those talk shows. And I, as usual, I was preparing uh, the Q's and A's that I thought might come up during the program. And I knew the inevitable question is, well, now, Mr. Nixon, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to run for president or what have you? And I tried to think, how in the world can I answer it? And then the thought struck me. This is one of the advantages of preparing things yourself, because it forces you to think a problem through. And the best strategy comes from getting the mind engaged in dealing with the problem. And the thought come, came to me, I'm going to answer that question. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to take a holiday for politics, a holiday for six months. Well, I announced it on the program to the consternation of everybody, because I didn't inform anybody in advance. And some of my friends thought, all is lost. The guy's out of his mind and so forth. But I knew exactly what I was doing. I did it for several reasons. One, Tom Dewey, years before, had given me very good advice. He said, there are times when a person in public life should get out uh, of the public view. People get tired of hearing their politicians over and over again. Now, I know this isn't this isn't something that will be accepted by the pipsqueaks that advise most of our political leaders today. They think unless their man's on the evening news and the morning news and the radio or what have you, at 24 hours a day that he isn't dominating the dialogue. They don't realize that people sometimes would prefer not to have the man on, to go away and then come back in, back and forth. Uh, to engage in the great rhythm of politics is very, very important to know. So first, I knew that it was well for me to get off stage for a while. Second, I was tired of campaigning, of making speeches and so forth. Third, I thought people might be tired of me uh, because I've been out there so long. And then another reason was I wanted the opportunity to think things through. Uh, by that, I meant that uh, if I had the chance to travel abroad, and I announced at that time shortly thereafter, that I was going to make trips around the world to the four big areas of the world, a trip to Asia, a trip to Latin America, a trip to Africa, a trip to Western Europe. I found that after six months of traveling, I would refurbish my foreign policy uh, image, call it what you like, but particularly what I knew about foreign policy. I knew that if I were going to run in 1968, I wanted to be the best prepared candidate in history in what I thought was going to be the major issue, the issue of foreign policy. So all of these reasons uh, certainly motivated me in, in making that decision. And another reason was that I felt that it was probably from a political standpoint advisable to let the new men in town to get out to show what they could do, uh, to see whether they, after hitting in the minor leagues, they could play in the big leagues, and very few could just as George Romney discovered. He was a fine governor and an excellent candidate at the Michigan level, but he turned out to be a flop at the national level. Uh, so these were the reasons that motivated me, and as it turned out, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Some uh, analysts say that you, uh, you, did, uh, you did it for precisely the reason of uh, sort of forcing, uh, flushing out the potential opposition before they were ready in the same way that some analysts have applied the same analysis to what uh, Senator Kennedy did recently by taking himself out of the race and thereby forcing everybody else uh, in prematurely, at least by what they conventionally would have expected to be their timetable. Did you have, did you have that in mind then and do you think Senator Kennedy may have had that in mind now? No, my primary reason was not that. 